And we decided to switch my talk. So if you came here for the toast talk, this is the this is not it. If you're interested in that, I can just give you the paper and you could read it. And I would tell you the exact same thing here. So there's nothing nothing that you're missing. So uh, jumping on what Michael said and what some of quite a few other people have said about um, our practices is that it's been my belief, and the belief has made me fairly unpopular in some circles, that what we rely on too often anymore in our educational endeavors is dogma rather than research on what actually works. And we're all susceptible to it. Um, and I'm not going to be able to finish this talk, so I'm just going to tell you uh, what I would get to in the final slide if I could get there. And that is um, that as we're approaching our projects, we need to assume that we're emotionally compromised. If you've been running a project for a really long time, your heart's in it. Not only that, but your participants' heart's in it because they've connected with you and they're very likely to tell you the thing that will make you feel good about yourself <laughs> because we have a little social contract with each other and that's beautiful and wonderful. But you should assume that everybody in this situation is compromised. You should assume that your program doesn't actually work. You don't want to think that, but you have to assume it. You have to, I will say later, grok the null hypothesis. You have to become one with it. That there is a very good likelihood that nothing is changing, except a whole bunch of people are feeling good about themselves and having some fun. You have to assume that um, if something is working, you don't actually understand why it's working. You have your reasons for it, but unless your reasons match with the larger body, a theory about how people think about themselves and how they learn and cognition and neuroscience and everything else, you're probably wrong. And that's okay, because these things can be learned. And then after you think those things, you have to be a steely eyed missile man and go back and look at your own practice and your own evaluation and research with ruthlessness. And you have to be willing to cut out with the spoon all the junk and all the stuff that's not working. I couldn't say that a whole lot of places, but I've been watching you guys, and, and there's a whole lot of love and a whole lot of people doing really wonderful, beautiful, jewel-like things in, in little silos. And I think that people like you could probably hear this message. So my battery is running low, so whatever it's plugged oh, into is not working. I can get that. All right, so research and evaluation should keep us in a place where we are doing the best possible things. But I'm going to put forward to you, I'm going to give you just something to think about, that we cannot possibly all be doing the best, most high-quality programs. In astronomy alone, NSF alone has put in over $100 million since the 1980s. NASA alone puts in $50 million to education in astronomy and the earth sciences every year on top of their regular programs, which does not count Department of Education or individual observatories or individual universities. We put a tremendous amount of money into astronomy, probably more per pupil than any other scientific domain. Thank, thank you, NASA. Yay. With all that input, we have, should have changed the world, and yet we have not. And that means that a lot of people, no one here in this room, other people out there are doing programs that probably aren't that effective. It, that must be true. We have to accept that as a reality. If we were all doing the best things with that much resource going in, the world would be a far better place. So we got to suck it up, buttercup, and admit <laughs> that we're not all doing the best stuff, but we could do better. Not anybody in here, you'll right. So research and evaluation should take us on the greater, higher path. But it doesn't. Because research in the ideal world, which should look like this, actually looks like this. This is the modern world. It's not about putting out a juicy paper that is going to change the way we conceive about student learning. It's about getting the most papers on your CV, least publishable units, because you've got a TMP and you don't want to hear your dean bitch at you anymore. Right? That's what's going on here. An evaluation, and I want to say that you've got three of the best evaluators that I know of in this field, in the world, working on this project. So kudos to you. I don't know how you pulled that off. Um, but for most evaluators, it is simply a job of telling the PI what they want to hear so that they don't get kicked off the show. That's what's going on. 
And it's a bit of a song and dance to get the funders to give you more money next time. I think we all know that, but we don't say it, and that keeps us from getting to the point of doing research and evaluation that really could change things. So I do believe that this is fixable. And I'm going to show you two case studies where I think if we just shifted the way we do research and evaluation, we could get down to the nitty gritty past our dogma and we get back to doing really good stuff. And there are four things we need to do. The first one is, in education or in anything that's a soft, squishy field, in education, psychology, all these things, we are a soft, squishy field, right? It is our responsibility to be more diligent about doing good science than the hard sciences. And in the hard science, if you remember, your job is not to prove things to be true. Your job is to disprove things that are false. Our job is always to be in the business of disproving what is baloney, right? And in my field, we have to be more diligent, diligent about disproving our own nonsense. And unfortunately, I'm caught doing it, and a lot of my colleagues are caught not being tough enough on ourselves. So we gotta, if it's squishy, you gotta disprove it, not prove it. Um, we also need to demand that work be theory-laden. And by that, I mean it must connect to the larger body, right? If you are finding that your program is doing a really great thing and you have no explanation from outside your own work for why that's true, and I don't mean from other evaluations and other research papers that are similar to yours, but if the words Dewey and Vygotsky and people like this are not coming up in your paper, you're probably not theory laden and you need to go read those guys because they're really smart even though they died a long time. And the last important thing is that you must rock envelop, come to own the null hypothesis. Again, assume you are doing no good, which is really painful, but you got to. The fourth bonus, we have to, sorry, you have to use positive, a positivist framework if you're gonna do science. You have to believe that there is an actual objective world out there that is knowable, and that is knowable using rigorous, time-tested empirical methods. It's that, and that probably seems like something one shouldn't have to state, but there are entire colleges who are based in postmodernism, which assumes that there is no objective reality, and that reality is merely a construct of your framework. If you're using one of those frameworks for your research, it's probably baloney, and you're probably just writing what you want to hear. So go hardcore. Your astronomers, your physicists, for goodness sakes, require objectivity in the work. All right, so a couple of case studies that I want to throw out to you guys, kind of demonstrate the difference. All right, this you, I think you guys would be interested in. It's about citizen science. What you guys do is sort of kind of like that. Um, so the question was thrown out almost a decade ago now. If we want to improve citizen science projects, how can we better understand them? And basically, how can we understand them by looking at what is arguably the most successful citizen science project ever, Galaxy Zoo? I think that's an awesome, awesome question. Because we're looking at a specific case that's out on the fringe, and we're looking at it with purpose. I love it. So I'll show you three ways that this was going. Test number one. This um, paper was a pilot study that was published. I know you're asking, why was the pilot study published? I wasn't the editor of that journal. <laughs> um, probably shouldn't have been, but it was done by a friend of mine, and I think it was a really good first stab at the work. So um, what he did was this. He looked at motivation as probably, you know, maybe the framework for why this project was so successful. And he did about 20 interviews. From those interviews, he coded them. He came up with some initial themes for what might work. Then he looked at the forum related to Galaxy Zoo. Um, one of the Galaxy Zoo people put out a for, uh, post that said, hey, you guys, a uh, quarter million of you, have categorized 50 million galaxies in the last 300 days. That's a lot. Why'd you do that? An excellent question. Um, anyway, what they did was they then used this framework that they created to code those responses. And this is what they got as an answer to the question of how can we help other citizen science projects by looking at galaxies here. And I look at this, and I says to myself, this is, this is me on a Saturday night with my cocktail in hand. I'm the sad panda reading papers. And I go, meh, because this doesn't mean anything to me. I, I, how would I use that? Fun? 
astronomy? That, that shouldn't have surprised anyone. How does it help um, Sandy Henderson improve blood burst for Citizen Science Project? It doesn't. Therefore, it did not answer the question. And the primary reason I believe this to be true is because this is a non-theory-laden approach. This doesn't connect to the broader framework. So some real smarty pants looked at that and redid the project and decided, under the influence of, of Dr. McKinnon, to use Luxemanser because, Stephanie, it'll get down to the higher order concepts. <laughs> well, it got us down to these higher order concepts. Pro-Am collaboration, community, addiction. This is actually published. It actually has my name on it. So I am showing you my contribution to the 80% peer-reviewed literature that's total bunk. This is my contribution to this. Um, the lead author on this was a graduate student, but still my name's on it, so I'm responsible, right? It's complete uselessness. We did put a, a graphic representation of this data in here, but again, what would one do with it? So again, drunk sad panda on a Saturday night going, meh, I did that. What was I doing? And the reason I knew it was wrong, even though it was my work, is because when I read what people had said in the forum, I knew that this stuff doesn't catch it. Because they said things like this. Now, neither lexamancer or word frequency count could make sense of this. Neil Armstrong probably got jettisoned by the program. And all the words in this set of sentence would have gotten jettisoned by lexamancer as being not worth paying attention to. But you all know what they mean. What do you feel when you hear these words? What does this mean? And why would a person take the time to write this as their response? This was not captured in the previous analysis. Because we're now looking at things in the theory, the theory field of identity, of um, spirituality, of emotion. These were some other things that people wrote, and there's no way you're going to be able to read them all. Um, but again, None of the previous analyses could make any sense of this. And this, this is a bit of a longer one, but I think this one, this short one, most of you would recognize these words. Do you know who wrote this? Blake. Blake. Blake, what's he talking about? Something spiritual. Good job, Tom. So this, one, this one's actually a C.S. Lewis, yeah. right? So this is a poem written by C.S. Lewis. He's talking about death. Why would a person say it right about death in their... Uh, Galaxy Zoo blog posts because he's saying the only reason that I would leave this beautiful earth is because I know what's next is the universe. And he's, he's attaching, the, the blogger attached C.S. Lewis's sentiments, an author, by the way, who's best known for his Christianity, not for the language of the wardrobe, he's best known for his faith and his commentary on that. Um, he's connecting a spiritual thing that these other kinds of analysis could never caption. And of course, Blake, also uh, well known for his spiritual take. These kinds of things are the things we need to look at. So, we use the grounded theory approach. We analyzed 1,400 posts. Notice, we analyzed 800 randomly selected to create the theory of why these people were involved here. And then use 600 to try to disprove ourselves. To find evidence in the following 600 posts to see if we were wrong. If you're not doing that, you're not doing it right. Thank goodness I had a great person on my committee who told me I have to do this every time, because now, anyway. What do we find? All right, authentic participation, which by the way, you guys do. You guys were just talking about real science, with real scientists making real contributions, and students and individuals in galaxies who can tell the difference between that and the other stuff that they've been doing, this is the classroom science. This is you guys all over the place. A bit of transcendence, spirituality, awe, an elevation of the human spirit. Right, so we look, I look at this and I go, oh, Vygotsky. I look at this and go, oh, Frankel. Um, community structure. Right, we can look at all the people who write about socially constructed knowledge. Right there. Galaxy Dude doesn't just have a blog. They have a really, really active blog where people find themselves at home. That is also what you guys create in many of the projects that you do. Um, and for, this is an odd one because we're dealing with much older adults sometimes, it was a second chance for them to go back and be the scientists that they wanted to be when they were children, but were told or were afraid that they couldn't be. So, we tried to disprove ourselves, we connected it to theory, and we were willing to call baloney on ourselves. 
And in, in our case, it was important that we call Bologna because we already published a Bologna paper on this topic. <laughs> so, um, sorry for any of you who read that. All right, second case study, research experiences. This may also be of interest to you. Um, a question that's been asked many times is, what are the educational retention and pipeline benefits of an REU type program? Most of you know REUs. Drop in over the summer, students come from different places, they work here on a project, they write something up, they go home, yeah? Well, there's a bajillion papers written about this, and almost all of them use Likert type surveys, which should not be used when measuring motivation or identity or effect. Particularly if you're interested in women and minorities, because much research shows that women and minorities respond to Likert type surveys, Likert type surveys, differently than males do. Because we don't like having to choose one of those, because it depends. And so we tend to put threes all over the place. If we like you, we put fives. If we hate you, we put ones. It has it makes no sense. There's no there's no goodness there. And I can share those those resources on liquor type stories. But they also do um, recapture interviews. So let's say the student didn't say what they learned. We go find those students and we say, excuse me, you didn't indicate what you learned in our program. Please tell us what you learned. Well, nothing is an impolite thing to say. So they come up with some. Um, and they always collect the data at the end of the program when everybody's still in happy summer camp mode. And when these kids still want to get a letter of recommendation from you. So, no, no bueno. What these types of research projects always find is that these six week long projects change the world. This is my response to that. <laughs> Are you raising your hand to tell me I'm done? Oh my gosh, I haven't finished, yay. This is my favorite inner here right now. Baloney! It's baloney, there's no way. There is nothing in the larger body of research on human learning and identity and psychology that will explain why an out of context six week program would change anyone's life. Particularly when they had to be a highly competent student who had an advisor who would help them and who would tell them the REO program existed prior to them being in the program. You picked winners, you didn't make winners. No, I don't believe it, it's baloney. Tell us. So we took a second, second tack into this. And in this question we said, what if any are the educational pipeline and retention benefits of these programs? First looked at retention and it turned out the programs made no difference. It did not matter whether they had a good experience or a bad experience. If we wanted to predict whether or not they stayed in astronomy, we looked at what they said incoming prior to the REU program. That is the predictor. Almost nobody changes their mind. You will only find that out if you follow people a long time down the road and if you kept that data from up front and if you're open to the idea that you should do anything to change retention. It's a very narrow pathway. Yeah. Um, anyway, we decided to again construct a theory. We looked at thousands of pieces of artifact data data, their time logs, interviews, interviews, interviews with their at-home supervising advisor at their home institution, with whoever advising their RU, yeah, yeah. We looked at tons of stuff. And we looked at 15 years of follow-up data. We followed hundreds of students, contacted them every year. The oldest ones for 15 years. Um, and then we made an attempt to disconfirm. After we created that theory, we contacted 20 other people who we felt like were most likely to disprove us and call baloney on us. And we interviewed them until we reached theoretical saturation, which means we've interviewed, interviewed so many people, we're unlikely to find anybody. And here's what we found. There are no educational retention or pipeline benefits of our youth programs in astronomy because we pick winners rather than me. There are none. And indeed, when we contacted those 20 people, we, they knew us through the REU, but we didn't tell them that we were researching the REU. We asked them to tell us their stories. Tell me your story of how you got here. Tell me who mattered most to you. Tell me the experiences that mattered most to you. Not one, not a single person mentioned any of their REU programs, and most of them had gone to multiple programs which is a little known secret. If you've gone to one RU, you've probably gone to three. So that's a lot of money being put to somebody who's gonna become an astronomer anyway. Um, none, no, no benefits. However, 
Oh, and we did say, well, what about the RE program? That's where I met you. And they went, meh. <laughs> We're like drunk panda. <laughs> <laughs> what we did find out, though, in analyzing all that data is that some things do matter, and it came into four very clear themes. Authentic participation in a program that is long-term, that is part of a community where they belong, and that tends to happen early. Not a single, and this is looking at the females, not a single female participant mentioned a single experience post high school that mattered one iota in her decision to go into astronomy, in her own words, asked to disconfirm herself. Not one. The most impressive program that we saw was the SSP program. The number of women who've been in that program who said, that was when I knew where I belonged. Pretty impressive. The RSI program. Programs like those. You guys know, you looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. SSP. SSP, SSP Summer, Summer Science, Science Program, program right? Mm -hmm. And Ojai, and Socorro. Yeah. Long term, right? Looking at a community of like-minded kids, right? Now these programs do not create scientists out of people who intended to be auto mechanics. But they created scientists out of kids who had the potential to become scientists. Some of the students who have been in SSP, and some of you are nodding like you're in the program, when I looked at their evaluation data, decades later, participants say that that was the most important program that they ever participated in and determined their career pathway. So those guys are doing something right, and unfortunately they're not getting $100 million a year. We should change this. So, um, I got to the end. <laughs> so that's all I have to say, and I'm probably out of time, which is my plan. <laughs>